From the Fidelity Bank Foundation Studio, PBS Kansas presents One on One with Victor Hogstrom. Welcome to One on One, where each week I have an in-depth conversation with a notable Kansan. We talk about life and lessons learned along the way. My guest this time is Splurge Magazine publisher Jody Klein. Klein and her husband Terry took over the magazine in 2007 with no publishing experience whatsoever. Yet, under her direction, Splurge has emerged as Wichita's premier lifestyle, fashion, and entertainment magazine. But such success is not surprising when you realize that Jody Klein has always been a doer, eager to jump in and tackle one challenge after another. Coming up, we'll discuss the factors that have given her the courage and determination to step out of her comfort zone and make a difference in our world. And for the first time, Jody will reveal a dramatic personal secret she has never shared publicly until now. It's an emotional, real-life story about her past that she continues to come to terms with and piece together. This promises to be a compelling and emotional half hour as I go one-on-one -on -one with Splurge Magazine publisher Jody Klein right now. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Victor Hawkstrom. I'm so delighted to welcome the publisher of Splurge Magazine, Jody Klein, to the program. Welcome. Thank you. We took a, a while trying to get this going, uh, working on it. You're a busy woman. No, I just procrastinated a lot because this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole career. You will find it easy. Okay. Okay. So before we uh, begin with the turnaround story of Splurge Magazine, let's begin with your backstory, your growing up days, and tell us about, about those days, and, and where did you grow up, and all of the wonderful all things. All the details, okay. I was the youngest of six children, born in Litchfield, Illinois. My father was a coach, counselor, and teacher. He was actually, in his younger days, he was a scholar athlete for the University of Iowa, played football and track. My mom was a homemaker with the six kids and rather really busy because of all of us were in sports. Um, life was pretty hectic growing up because uh, we didn't have a whole lot of extra things and we had a two bedroom home with eight people and one bathroom, which that seemed perfectly normal and we never complained about that because we just thought that was pretty normal for mm -hmm. growing up. So. so as you were growing up, what were your aspirations? Well, I learned around age eight that education and family were the most important things to me. And primarily because my mother really instilled that I needed to have an education. She pressed upon me how important it was, I needed to be independent. And so I primarily wanted to be, have a, a family and be a mother. So I remember specifically telling her that I was gonna have a baby at 15 <laughs> because that's how bad I wanted to be a mother, right. but I was gonna get married at age 20 so my baby would have a father. I did not realize I needed the father first right. to have the baby. So it took me a few years to figure that out. Um, but after that, I just babysat all the time. I just loved children and everywhere I went, I seemed like I had a baby carrying, uh, carrying around a baby. And um, so then I actually, uh, the other thing was I wanted to be the nurse. And so uh, right out of high school, I started an, an LPN program, which wasn't really the direction I had hoped for. I was wanting the RN program, but this worked out well for me because so I, I really didn't want to leave home. And uh, once I realized I was in the program and I needed to finish the program first so I could go on to RN school, I um, was inspired by a lot of the other students in my class. It was a private school and they were much older than I am at the time. And I said, why are you in school now? And all of them had failed marriages and single moms. And I was like, wow, this is something I really need to focus on because this is a reality for a lot of people. So I really worked hard to get the, my RN. And so it took me like nine years to become an RN because I had so many fabulous jobs along the way. I had the opportunity to continue my education in Arizona. And so I moved in Arizona, to Arizona. And at that time, um, 
I took a job for Cigna Health Plan, and I had I just kept getting promotion after promotion. Mm -hmm. And then I took a job for Glaxo Pharmaceutical. And so eventually I had to quit um, all those jobs because I wanted my RN. Right. And so I uh, was finally able to go back to school and graduate with my RN. You had made enough money to do so, I take it. Yes, yes. Uh, But what I'm hearing from you is that you were pretty perceptive as you were growing up. Um, and, And the emphasis in education from your mother uh, played a key role. Yes. Why is that? I think um, she uh, didn't have an education and she was always so proud of my dad, her Walter was my father's name, um, because he had an education and he was an athlete and she was so proud that she, even without an education, she could still find someone to marry her that had that level of education. And, uh, and so I, she, I think she wanted more for me. She wanted me to feel independent that I uh, was not trapped because I feel like she felt like she was trapped many times. Well, how was that? Um, like I said, growing up was kind of rough. Um, I remember I, w- I couldn't even really have sleepovers at times because I never knew if a fight was going to break out as often with some of the, my siblings <laughs> and my mother. Um, but uh, she uh, had a secret. I guess. She had a secret. And it took me years to find that secret. Your mother had a secret? Yes. Okay. And I think you discovered that secret, what, 10 years ago? About 10 years ago, yes. You want to share it? Sure. Um, so growing up, you know, I, like I said, I was the youngest of uh, the six children. I had a um, uh, a normal lifestyle. I mean, it was normal. Like I said, it was um, hectic at times. But there was six kids, so it's going to be hectic. But I always had my mom's support. I was her golden child, and I could do no wrong. I, um, she was so proud of me all the time. But my dad wasn't, and it's, he was a wonderful man. He was very calm. Um, he was kind of the peacemaker of the family. But I was never daddy's little girl, and I couldn't figure out why because I was perfect in my eyes. <laughs> and so um, there's three girls and three boys in the family. And so he always paid more attention, I felt, to the boys because they were athletes and he was a coach, and so it made more sense. But um, I just had grew up with a lot of unanswered questions. And, um, and so finally, 10 years ago, I found out that the father who raised me, Walter, was really not my father. But he doesn't know that. And um, we, unfortunately, he passed away in 2007. And um, I found out, I think, like I said, 10 years ago, that he wasn't my father. And so all of a sudden, I got to realize who I really was. I did a lot of research. I've talked to family members um, that I've never met yet to, yet to this day yet. But it really answered a lot of my questions on who I was and why was I so different than my siblings. That, to me, Um, People ask me now as an adult, were you angry at your mother? I'm like, no, it makes sense. It really closed doors and opened new ones for me. But um, it was, uh, it just made sense. And so I um, I had to do some research to really figure out if this was the truth. But I did find my biological father, his name is George, and he was still alive. And this was a few years ago. He died at 96, um, age 96. And so um, we chatted for a little bit, not a whole lot. I didn't get to meet, a chance to meet him. His, um, it just didn't work out. So, so how did you find out? Um, my aunt knew because um, my mother had to- shared the information with her because my biological father was actually sending child support checks to her. And then she would write a check on her account so it wouldn't be um, found out, discovered. And so um, right before she passed away, she told one of my siblings that you need to let Jody know this. So about 10 years ago, I received a phone call from my brother, Barry, and said, are you sitting down? And, and it's like, whenever you get one of those phone calls, you're always wondering, oh no, what's, what's it gonna be? And, um, and, and Barry was Walter's son. Yes, okay. yes. And so he just gave me all the information I needed to know. And at first I didn't really understand it. I didn't accept it. And, but at the same time, I'm going, well, this makes sense. And I wasn't angry. I was just kind of in a little bit of shock, maybe. Um, 
and I can remember you know, writing notes down, and then I just started researching and finding uh, family members on Facebook, actually. And they accepted me as friends, but they didn't really know why that we were related, and I didn't want to tell them yet because I wasn't for sure. Mm -hmm. And then the family joke is, and my kids make fun of me all the time because I'm a huge supporter of Ancestry.com. And so um, that really, that actually answered all my questions is Ancestry.com. So your mother then was receiving these payments from your biological father through your aunt. Right. But she, was she working? Did she have a job? Did her husband, Walter, not ask where are you getting all this money from well, all the time? My Aunt Ruth was actually um, only had one child and she uh, had significantly more money than we did. So it was not unusual for her to support us and that's what it looked like she was just helping us. And so I remember my mom loved fashion and so she took me shopping every Monday evening um, to buy a new outfit for school and that's probably one of the funny things I have in um, a memory that someone told me I just don't believe it because I moved to Decatur, Illinois from Litchfield when I was third grade and the classroom remembers me arriving midterm in go-go boots. <laughs> and, and I do not have any memory of my go-go boots, but they said I had shorts on and go-go boots and I showed up for my first day of school. And uh, that sounds like something my mother would have dressed me in in third grade. <laughs> but um, so I always seemed to have the latest fashion and the cutest clothes, even when he didn't have a whole lot of money. But now at the time I didn't understand it. Now looking back, now I realize that the money was coming from my biological father. But your mother tried to also tell you this real story. She did. She tried. And actually when I found this out, I was angry because that's the only thing that I was disappointed about is why did my mother tell me? She was my hero. She was my, I, she was my life support. She was my best friend. And I couldn't understand why she didn't tell me. Then looking back in 2000, she did try to tell me. She showed me a letter. And I read part of the letter, and she's, then she kind of went into denial. She goes, oh, that didn't happen. And, and so that was the last we heard of the letter. And then, here again, 10 years later, I find out. And so just coincidentally, over this past summer, we were remodeling, and I was getting rid of all the books that have, you know, outdated and things. And I found a book, and I'm like, this is an interesting book. When, I didn't remember purchasing it. So I looked at the copyright, and it was 2000. So um, when I was going through it, a letter fell out. And that was a four-page handwritten letter from my bio biological father to my mother. And it was uh, quite personal, very intimate, mm -hmm. and kind of stating that he couldn't realize that the relationship had to end because we are moving to Decatur from Litchfield. And at that time, we only had landlines. So there's really no way to communicate to her. So I have to admit, I just um, cried, cried, and cried <laughs> because... He was so much in love with my mother. Mm -hmm. And so it was important um, to me to know that I just was not a one night stand. I know my mother probably isn't proud that she had this um, extramarital relationship, but it was like a third, uh, seven year relationship. And one of the movies that she recommended that I watch, here again, I didn't know why, was The Bridges of Madison County. So if you haven't watched that, it's kind of her story. And I, when I listened to that, I actually did an audible on t book, and I could visualize her in every scene. Mm. And it, really, that even listening to that, rewatching that, kind of helped me understand the story a little bit more. So now, knowing all of these things, who is Jody Klein? That's an interesting question because I find I'm rediscovering myself all the time. I find something new about myself. Um, and, um, but I keep, every time I go back to my mom, she was, like I said, she was my hero. She um, provided me the confidence that I needed to make the decisions, um, to set your goals and don't give up on your goals. And that was what my goals, be a mom and a nurse. And so she just encouraged me all the way. So, um, but I'm, I feel like sometimes I'm an orphan because I really now have no um, full uh, blood sisters. They're only half and um, we're not close at all. Uh, matter of fact, when she, my mother passed away, we really have lost communication with most of them. Um, but we are so different, and uh, so that made it easier not to have a, a relationship with them because we are so different in many, in many different levels. Very interesting story. And yes, it was, um, I have to say, I actually prayed about this because I wasn't sure if I was going to go that direction, 
but I kind of felt like I was not being transparent if I didn't bring that up, and I have never publicly told the story. Mm -hmm. So this is the first. My friend, some of my friends know, and like um, my son, um, who's uh, Chad, he's our third child, he's a dentist in Maine, and he just recently, with the movie that came out, Our Father, now this might make me cry, <laughs> he called me and said, Mom, I really feel bad because um, he what, listened to these women's testimonies of finding out that they really had a different father. Mm -hmm. And he said, it was really no different than you. And we didn't support you. We laughed at you. We made fun of Ancestry.com. And, and it's OK. I took it very lightly. But for him to be so compassionate and come back and tell me that just a few months ago, that, that really touched my heart. Because it is kind of shocking. But it's only been positive for me because yeah. it really um, answered a lot of questions. Well, it's a touching story. and I. Uh, I'm proud of you for telling and for sharing it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so let's move on to something else. Okay. Well, you have demonstrated that you don't have to be uh, or have any experience as a publisher to turn a magazine around. Okay. And you have turned Splurge magazine into a household name in, in our community. And everybody goes looking through it just about every month. How did you do that? Well, I cannot take credit for myself, um, by myself. First of all, a uh, li little background, Splurge had actually closed right. in 2007. Mm -hmm. So my husband and I were approached to become investors and reopen the magazine. I thought it actually kind of sounded fun, and so we did it. Uh, we also um, included our brother-in-law and then uh, Dr. Denny Ross and his wife, Anne. And so we thought this was the greatest thing ever. And then six months later, we really, it was kind of, to be honest, a money pit, and uh, we had to invest a lot of money um, to keep it going, and we had the choice to close it or keep it going. Well, I was um, super nervous about keeping it going because I really wanted to stay at home with my children. That was my career as, as being a stay-at-home mom, and so, but I chose to keep it going because we had several employees that needed to continue working, and so I was the only investor available, and so we said, well, I'll give it my best shot, and so, um, being surrounded by people who knew what they were doing. I can remember specifically being in a meeting and they would say the, you know, this terminology that I had no idea what they were talking about, so I'd just write a little note and I'd go home and embarrassingly look it up because I didn't even know what they were talking about. So everyone trained me well, I would say. Um, uh, I think my background in pharmaceutical sales helped me with the sales aspect of it and my nursing degree helped me with the, the relationship of a client. It doesn't matter if they're well or you know sick, it's just there's that patient, um, that personal relationship that you mm -hmm. get with a, a client. So overall, what's your perspective of the magazine now? I'm so thankful we decided to keep it going. Um, I have made friendships and partnerships that I will probably have my lifetime. And uh, I mean, I really didn't know anyone when I moved here in, in Wichita. I was mm -hmm. a stay-at-home mom with the children. And so um, my, some of my best friends are through Splurge. And so I'm very thankful because um, We've had advertisers that have been with us from day one. We've our readers, we couldn't do it without our readers, but main, main people I wanna thank is my staff because they've been very patient with me and they, um, I think they're impressed when I know something that they don't <laughs> because they have so much more experience than I, I have. But uh, so I've, I've learned along the way, but like I said, I've been surrounded by a lot of very talented individuals. So what's the goal uh, for Splurge? Well, um, people ask me because at some point, I mean, I'm, I'm getting up there in age. <laughs> and so um, my partner, Amy, she's our vice president. Um, so right now, there's, uh, we have three owners, um, my husband and I, Denny Ross, and then Steve Rood. And, um, you know, magazines, everyone say, you know, the print is going out, but it really isn't. As a matter of fact, I spoke with our uh, publishing company, our uh, printer, and he said they're printing more magazines than ever now. And um, it's hard to find staff, though, that's educated in, this, in the printing industry. But he said, it's not going away. And so just be patient. And so that's what we're doing. And I, I just don't, I don't see an end point. I think Amy will be fabulous at um, continuing helping me and taking it over if there's ever a point that I feel like I've had enough. Mm -hmm. But uh, she, does a, she does so much. It helps balance my life out with some of the, my hobbies that I have, some of my passions. Right, right. 
All right, uh, so uh, moving from splurge, let's come back to you again. Uh, you had a husband and two children previously. Yes, I did. Uh, the marriage broke up and then in 1999, you had a life-changing accident. I did. I actually had two life-changing experiences. And the first one was I lost my best friend to suicide. Mm. That is hard. When you're a nurse and a nurturer and you feel like you can save anyone, and I couldn't save him. And so after that, I decided I needed to do something that could occupy my mind. My son and daughter, uh, Kelsey and Chad, were both in gymnastics. I had that cheerleading background. I said, there's an adult class. I'm going to be an adult gymnast. <laughs> so I signed up for the classes. And um, I guess I was like, what, 36 at the time? And it's kind of like riding a bike, is what you think. You think if you can do a backflip then, you can do one now, <laughs> right? Well, technology had changed a little bit. I wasn't used to spring floors. I was used to the gym floor of a cafeteria, which was all tile. Right. And so I decided to start tumbling, and I just had a really bad landing, and I broke both legs. Wow. I had four fractures. <laughs> People thought I was actually in a car accident or a skiing accident. It was like, how could you have four fractures from gymnastics? And I literally blew out both ankles. And so um, I had a trip planned to California, and so I went in my wheelchair, and um, happened to be at the Pasadena uh, Ritz-Carlton. They had lots of large throw rugs, and I kept trying to get my wheelchair through, and so the gentleman kept helping me through everywhere I needed to go, and, and that's my husband, Terry. He was just a very compassionate, um, interesting individual that I felt our first conversation, we definitely had an attraction. Mm. So if I hadn't broken my legs, I probably wouldn't have met him because right. he was the one pushing me to, to the dinner, to my nail appointment, wherever I needed to go. So, and then we kept in touch for three and a half years long distance because I was living still in Arizona at the time and he was still in Wichita. So you will say that that accident led you to what? Um, gosh, it led me to more children, which is what I wanted. Uh, led me to Splurge Magazine. It led me to uh, a new successful marriage. We've been, um, well, we met in 99. So now uh, this year, next month, gosh, in a week or so, we're going to be having our 20th anniversary. Mm. And so. So it was love at first sight. I would say so. I would say so. You don't want to admit that because it's time. I wasn't really prepared to be in a relationship. Matter of fact, I called my mom. I said, Mom, I met this really wonderful guy. And her response was, he must be desperate. <laughs> because <laughs> I was not getting around very well at that time. And so. so you get married to him and you settle here in Wichita. Yes, I did. With uh, your, your blended family. Yes. We added two more children. So he had a daughter, Laura, and then I had Kelsey and Chad. And then now we have Tate and Tacey together. So... Um, that was just the highlight of my life, actually. Your name again, Tate and Tacey? Tayton and Tacey. Are they twins? No, they're oh. 18 months apart. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you have two doctors in the family. Well, there's there three. There's three. three well, yeah. okay. Um, my brother-in-laws are two doctors with my husband, the three doctors, the three Klein okay. brothers. And then my son-in-law is um, just visiting his third, finishing his third-year residency program at Cox Health in Springfield. Missouri, and then my son is a dentist, as I mentioned earlier, uh, graduated from UMKC and now practicing dentistry in Maine. All right. So. Um, so we have a little game we play in this program. Okay. And we'd like to try that out on you. Because I, I always say it, it helps the viewers understand you better. Okay. And this time I want you to tell me your favorite. All right? Okay. Uh, First one is time of day. I love nighttime. Anytime after midnight, I have so much energy. I can really? clean house. I can finish the magazine. <laughs> it's always been from 11. It used to be till 3 or 4 a.m., but I had to focus on sleep. So now it's from 11 to 1 or 2 a.m. What about season of the year? Definitely summer. Definitely summer. <laughs> Musical instrument. Um, piano. My um, father who raised me was a fabulous piano player. Do you play any no. instrument? No. No. I got kicked out of clarinet and <laughs> I, I quit because <laughs> someone told me I was going to get buck teeth if I played the clarinet. Um, so I quit <laughs> in middle school. 
Well, maybe that, that was a good thing because you have beautiful teeth. Well, thank you. But there's two bands, orange and blue, and I was not in the best band. So I'm like, that was humiliating to oh. put me in the... It just showed that I did not have any musical talent. All right. Um, your favorite dessert? Well, this candy is candy dessert. I, well, my favorite dessert is always going to be white wedding cake. Oh. Yeah, but now it has to be gluten-free. So, so, so. Do, do, you, do you bake uh, white wedding cakes to serve at dinner at home? No, never. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> no, but I'm always usually trying to get one or two pieces at each wedding that we go to. I mean, my, my husband will give me his, the frosting. I love the frosting on wedding cakes. Uh, your favorite animal? Monkey. Monkey, why? Mon Growing up with the Beverly Hillbillies, <laughs> I wanted to be Ellie Mae all the time. I still to this day really? want a monkey. I would do anything to have a pet monkey. Wow. Your favorite pastime? Shopping. All right. <laughs> Shopping. That, it's not, it's, yeah, people call it an addiction. It's a hobby. I've gotten really good at it. And your favorite quote? My favorite quote would have to be Winston Churchill. We make a living by what we get and a life by what we give. That, right. that is actually on one of my favorite websites right now, <laughs> which we'll get into in another in a little bit. All right, um, we are out of time in this uh, half hour, and I'd like to let our viewers know that uh, because of how interesting this interview is, we will uh, do a part two next week. So please join us for part two of One on One with Jody Klein. And I thank you for watching this week's edition of One on One. Our email address is oneonone at kpts.org. That's if you have a question or comment. Until next time, I'm Victor Hawkstrom. Do take care.